Hey everybody, welcome back. It's uh, April 24th, 2017. This is Human Factors Cast. We're on episode 39. I can't believe 39 weeks have gone by and we've done this stuff every week. We're back to a slow week of Human Factors news. It's okay though, because we got guests on the show. We'll be breaking down everything from Facebook's F8 uh, conference to immoral artificial intelligence on today's show. Be sure to use this audio sample to build your own HFC, Human Factors Cast. Uh, and, and that Human Factors cast, <laughs> wow, unprofessional, I love it. Human Factors cast starts right now, let's do it. Welcome to Human Factors cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. And we're back for another energetic week of Human Factors stuff, news, exciting, fun things. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today through the magic of the internet by Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, the beautiful internet. Hello, Nick, on a wonderful Tuesday. It is a wonderful Tuesday. No, it's a wonderful Monday. What are you talking about? <laughs> are you, <laughs> Just to see if you're paying attention. You're messing yes, with it's me. It's a wonderful Monday. It's, ba- it's good to be back on Human Factors cast. It's good. And also joining us, we have Mia Haramijo joining us again. Hi, guys. She had so much fun last time. She's back again. I just had to come back. Yes, it did. So I'm glad you're here because we, again, we had a slow week, but we're going to be breaking it all down, talking about some fun stuff. But first, let's talk about some stuff that happened. Uh, I've been getting these emails from our listeners. Believe it or not, they actually like to know what's happening in our personal lives. It's weird, right? Being hosts of podcasts. Anyway, what's going on with you, Blake? Anything exciting on your end? Uh, not a whole bunch. I just finished up kind of taking a front end engineering class recently, but other than that, I've just been kind of, you know, doing the same old, same old, trying to start a consulting business. What about you, Nick? So, so hang on, I want to back up. You did a front end engineering class. Is there like a yeah? So is this like HTML, CSS, or is this like querying a database, or is it what is this? Uh, so this focuses a lot more on just like heavy JavaScript elements because I know a good bit of just basic front end program with CSS and HTML, but je- like making stuff interactive is a little more what I lack. So I've been taking a class through a, a company called the Iron Yard the and Iron actually Yard. had helped them with some of their UX problems that they were having um, and traded kind of my services for being able to learn to access their course early. So it was pretty cool. Excellent, excellent. Well, I've, uh, I got some fun stuff to talk about. So I actually went out and did the March for Science this weekend. Um, didn't run into I any. Did. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I did too. I, you did. I was just adding to yours. Oh, man. That was exciting. You went to the San Diego one, right? I did downtown, yeah. Yeah, I was in LA. Uh, how was the San Diego one? It was good. Um, unfortunately, though, the, the Facebook site said from 10 to 4, and I had my nephew's uh, baseball game, so I got there at 11, and they were already. Because they started from uh, the Civic Center all the way to the waterfront, and I just I missed part of it because I didn't realize that they were gonna shut it down. So after, um, after they did that walk, they apparently had some teachers doing some demonstrations for kids that wanted to learn about science, which I thought was really nice. Yeah, in L.A. they had a science expo afterwards. Uh, Blake, speaking of you taking classes, I've actually been taking some classes. Uh, so we on this show actually run into a lot of like artificial intelligence and deep learning kind of things. And so I've been branching out and taking some classes on these to kind of not sound like an idiot when we're when we're talking about them, because <laughs> I mean, we're always so baffled by them. So I just I wanted to get like sort of a, a foundation in them, so to speak. Uh, also, one one other like major thing. Uh, have you guys heard of the book Algorithms to Live By? Uh, a little no, bit. I... Tell us more. Oh, yeah, dude. What is it about? So it's exactly what it sounds like. So it kind of breaks down computer science and 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 uh, puts it in a way that makes it easily digestible for the listener to kind of go, "Oh, these are the types of things that I should be thinking about." You know, we're as human beings, we're very irrational a lot of the time, <laughs> and so this is kind of breaking down the logical way to approach problems that we face in everyday life, like the stopping problem, like. When do you stop and and when do you commit to something? Uh, the answer, by the way, is 37%. And it's a great book. I've been listening to it on my commute. Um, I'm not going to say with what service because 
we are bringing this show to you ad free. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, just keep that in mind. So anyway, let's move on to Human Factors News because we do have some stories, not a whole lot, but what we do have is so juicy that I can't wait to jump into it. So this is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. Now this could be anything from artificial intelligence, like I mentioned before, virtual reality, automation, medical transportation, whatever it is, as long as it has to do with human factor psychology design, it's fair game. Blake, what do we have up first this week? All right. So first, MasterCard is trialing a trip and pin bank card that includes a finger embedded, an embedded fingerprint reader, introducing a biometric authentication layer for, for card payments. For now, testers are required to insert the chip into the terminal and then place their finger and thumb on the reader to authenticate the payment. So far, the biometric card has been trialed at two locations in South Africa, with additional trials planned over the next few months in Europe and Asia. So I've got a few thoughts on this, guys, but I, but me and Nick, I really want to hear what you guys have to say. Mia, I would like to hear what you have to say. So I have a question about this. Is it mutually exclusive? Like you can only use this card if you do the dual uh, authentication, or is it one of those things where you can either do a pin or the fingerprint? That's a good question. From the way I was reading the article, it kind of sounds like it's exclusive. Like you have to use the um, the 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 biometric scanner, right? It, it's kind of like right. a it's it's kind of like um it 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 kind of effectively takes place of the pin. Yeah. So my thoughts on that are what so. This technology has been in place for a while through different things. I mean, cell phones have um, fingerprint access, and and I don't use it personally. I think it's annoying. But uh, for for a debit card, I think it's great for people that use their debit cards and only them, um, you know. But for example, I don't ever use it. But when I use it, I also let my significant other use it, so he can get money out or um, deposit money in, and that's out of the question if you have to use my fingerprint. So I'm not sure if they're kind of throwing the baby with the bath water in this one. Well, I mean, they could they could potentially bring in multi-user cards, right? Like you and your significant other could both register your thumbprints and then you could both use it. So I think it's cool. I think it's a great kind of alternative for pins. Um, you know, we know that biometric scanners aren't exactly super secure. It It's not easy to spoof them but it's still possible but it's definitely a step in the right direction uh from uh from pins i think it's it, it there's a little bit more complexity with a uh, with data validation at least blake now you said you had some thoughts on this i want to hear what you have to say so i mean when i read the article i thought it was great that if they're gonna introduce this that if it messes up like let's say you're too sweaty or you've got something on your hands that they'll use the pin as the alternate backup of course uh, so you're you're kind of safe if, for whatever reason, the fingerprint reader doesn't really work. Uh, the part about the people adopting this that I think is going to be hard is right now MasterCard forces you to go into a location to actually get your fingerprint scanned and all that kind of stuff. Um, and like you said, Nick, the thing that worries me is it's it's a little easier than people think. I mean, it takes a few more steps, but you can definitely hack these different biometric readers, especially for phones. I mean, there's videos on YouTube on how to do that. So I, it worries me about, is, is it really an extra layer of security or is it making it easier if somebody can take your fingerprint from the card and then they're bypassing ever to have your pin? Uh, so it's it's kind of got like some some pros and cons to it, but I think overall it's, it's a cool thing and I'd be inter interested to see if like the size of the card is it all affected because now it's got biometrics in it. So yeah, that'd be interesting too. I don't think I think they're getting small enough to to put it on without any sort of problem. I the one thing that I would like to know is if I try it, can I then disable it after the fact, right? Like if I try it and I realize yeah, no, this is not going to work out. Like can I just cancel the the biometric part of it and only use the pin? Like I don't know. I, I there's there's a lot to be there's a lot to figure out with this, I think. But it's it's cool that they're thinking about security in different ways. What would be really cool is if you had to do all three like three factor uh, authentication or or I guess it'd be two factor, right? Cuz you have the biometric scan and the pin and then now you have the chip. So, I don't know. Yeah, I was actually going to comment on the on the chip. Um when they were rolling them out 
they they had like a, a slow i don't know if it was because i was going to places that didn't have the ship the cheap reader but i felt like it was a slow adopting um technology even though it was supposed to be so much better for the customer uh and i still encounter places where the chip is not accepted yeah i think that's due to policy more than anything um policy and not technology okay i i, I don't know i i don't I, I don't I'm not an expert on it, but that that's my guess. Honestly, I think it actually does have something to do with the infrastructure of the technology of the place because I, I don't know why I pay attention, but the little boxes basically that Verifone makes that have the chip readers, a lot of different places have them, and some people don't have them enabled because and I've asked about it before, like why is this only like swipe when it's got a card reader on it? And it's about like getting into the infrastructure and being mm. able to read it from that store's um I, I guess just service. That's interesting. So it's, it, it's interesting stuff. The, oh, really quick side note. I was listening to another podcast and uh, remember a couple of weeks ago we had that whole, this is interesting. This is interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, no. Yeah. Right. I was listening to another podcast and they had a voice actress on. I won't say what podcast and I won't say what voice actress, but they had another one on and uh, every other phrase out of her mouth was, this is interesting. And it made me feel a whole lot better about the way we present information on this show now that we have brought that attention to ourselves. And so, no, we're not going to say that anymore. All right. Anyway, we spent too much time on this story. What's up next, Blake? Okay. So last week at F8, or as Nick said earlier, Fate, Facebook revealed that it has a team of 60 engineers working on building a brain computer interface that will let you type with just your mind without any invasive implants. The team plans to use optical imaging to scan your brain 100 times per second to detect your speaking silently in your head and translate it into text. Now, guys, I can't really even fathom how this actually works, especially because they talk about a little bit in the article about how they're not reading your random thoughts. They're only picking the ones that you're going to put in the speech center of your brain without an evasive implant. Now, Blake, it sounds like to me you just need to take a couple of classes on uh, human brain interfaces. <laughs> <laughs> you might be right. No, look out, uh, Elon Musk. Facebook's coming for you. No, this is... Uh, this is I am astounded by this idea right so i i love the concept in theory but then when when i don't know reading this article really kind of put me over the edge in terms of huh i think thoughts sometimes that i don't want to be out there <laughs> right and if facebook captures that while i'm thinking it then i mean you know nothing incriminating obviously but things that i just don't want to put out there those thoughts are mine, whether they be about a project that I'm working on and I'm not a fully developed an idea in my head yet. Uh, and like, what if it misreads my idea and puts it out there? Facebook then owns that data and they own my idea. I don't like that. I don't know. What do you think about this, Mia? I have so many thoughts about this. I can't even I don't even know where to start. But the first one that comes to mind is I'm thinking Big Brother, like where how is this going to work? Like how are you going to have no privacy whatsoever? You can't even like think to yourself and not have this out in the world. Um, the other one that I was thinking was, you know, when they're doing um, investigations and they're trying to ask people about what they know and what they don't know, whatever, um, this is going to take away all that, which is a good thing, obviously all that, um, you know, gray area where, you know, we don't, we believe you, but we, or you're trying to get um, testimonies out of people you're going to be able to read their mind. So how are people going to be able to hide if they know something or if, you know, if something is um, not true, how are they going to really, really get this through to the investigator? It's, it's, and a, then, ne it's the next level of polygraph test is what you're saying. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And if, um, and for security reasons, if somebody gets captured and you don't want to, obviously they're, they're tried to train these people to um, lie and pass lie detector tests. How are you going to pass this um, thinking bot that is reading your, your thoughts? I don't, I mean, this is crazy. Well, see, fortunately, the U.S. government supplies everyone with a pill that if you are in a situation with, no, I'm kidding. That's science fiction. <laughs> um, Mia, you brought up a good point about 1984. Did you see any, I, I just have to make a quick uh, side note here. Did you see any good signs at the, the March for Science? Because I saw some really good ones. 
I yeah, I saw some good ones about like um what would Albert do and uh there was another one about uh like r- r- raising above like tides are or something like that. There were a lot of really good ones. Um I saw one that your 1984 comment really it, it brought this one back. There was a there was a woman who had a a sign that says I was born in 1984, but I don't want to live in it. Oh yeah. Absolutely. That was that That's was pretty good. good. Blake, what are your thoughts on this one? So, I don't know. It freaks me out because I I can't get pe- I can't really believe the comments from Facebook about that we're not going to capture your random thoughts because it, I they say that they're only going to capture what hits the speech part of your brain. But anybody that knows a little bit about neuroscience realizes that it's like it's a holistic view when your brain lights up. There's not uh-huh. going to be just one specific area they can target every time that's going to be reliable. And the fact that they want to do this at scale, which is what they say in the article, it's going to have to function similarly similarly to how we use like Siri or Alexa. Like it, it's always listening. So it may not always be recording, but it is always listening. Yeah. Uh, so it freaks me out. I think it's great from like the medical perspective, which it talks about a little bit. Uh, and it takes that invasiveness out of uh, being able to give people the, the ability to, I guess, communicate without implants but still there's so many far-reaching ethical questions about it being able to read your mind and is it really putting the data anywhere uh it's scary to be honest to me the thing that really blew me away about this wasn't the fact that somebody is doing a human brain interface right because we've seen these announcements over the last couple weeks the thing that blew me away about this is that it's facebook this multi-billion dollar social media website wants to get in our brains that uh i don't know it doesn't sit well with me it doesn't sit well with me i will be uh i i don't know i was a i was a firm believer in hbis uh for a while (laughs) and you know the second a big multi-billion dollar corporation says we want in i'm like no i'm out (laughs) i don't know (laughs) all right speaking of facebook what what's up next let's get to the next one here All right, so a little more favorable news from the Facebook side. So Facebook is reaching an important milestone as it launches the first significant integration of social virtual reality into its core product. Facebook Spaces launched in beta last week on Oculus Rift. The product is a first taste of Facebook's ambitions to bring social interaction into 3D virtual spaces. With Spaces, those that have bought into the Oculus Oculus ecosystem can connect their Facebook accounts and dive into an environment where communication isn't about chat messages, but rather voice and avatar body language. Spaces is available now for free. Download in the early access, access section of the Oculus store. Now, Nick, I have to say we've got to get some kind of other next level VR that's out there because I know you have the PS... Uh, Four's version, but we've got to see if we can get one of these guys to send us an Oculus or something. Well, I, I, have, I would love to see what this is like. I have the Oculus. Uh, I don't have the most recent version. I have the dev kit for testing and development, but I do I do have the Oculus. I don't know if I can get on it with that, but um, I don't know. This thing this thing looks goofy to me, but uh, just because the avatars, the way they're, they're rendered, but that being said, social VR is where it's at, man. Like, it's it's VR is having a really hard time taking off and a lot of it is just pipe dream right like we we want to strap into these environments and be there and we're there but the um the thing that's really going to sell it is for people who you know have friends and family across the country and they can't hang out with them unless they're all on VR right like if if for example I was in New York or something and I wanted to hang out with my mom and dad here in California I could hop on toss my toss my uh fancy hat on and and then be able to see their avatars and i mean it's only a it's a step in that direction but i mean um to be able to interact in the same space miles and miles apart is what's gonna really kind of uh i I believe that's where where that's where the vr scene is gonna really take off i don't know mia what do you what are you thinking about this one well, I'm not a gamer, so the that side of you know hanging out with uh, friends and family, I, I hadn't thought about, but I did think about um, distributed teams and collaborating that way. When you don't have access to a video camera, where you can have a meeting and see somebody move, but if you can, again, get in the space where um, everybody's connected and they're all interacting, you can see somebody's body language. I think that's 
that's pretty powerful. And I told now that you mentioned it, I totally get um, you hanging out, quote unquote, with um, avatars. And then if the avatars get to be very human like, um, it would be much more connected than you would just on the phone. So I, I see it. Yeah, let me be clear. I don't. I, I think gaming is an incredibly powerful application of virtual reality, but I do not think that is where the future is going. I, I, I and honestly, I think virtual reality is going to peter out here pretty quick as soon as we get um, mixed reality systems that are uh, fairly powerful. Right, as soon as you can mask reality with um, convincing enough virtual components, and and then bring in some uh, real components into the mix then it's, that's where the magic is really going to happen so it's kind of like a mix between ar and vr but just imagine if you can mask it but yeah distributed teams um you and i work together mia and it's it's not impossible to do things uh in separate offices halfway you know across the world from each other but it 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 makes it so much easier when you can collaborate and when we are able to write on a whiteboard in the same same spare, same shared space we can very easily convey ideas to each other right and so for people who are working across the country uh yeah something like that would be really beneficial to them i think yeah i agree Blake you got anything else on this one I really have to add there is I think it's important what Mia first said when she started off talking about uh, this particular story and that she's not a gamer and I think Nick you're also right that the future of VR is really going to have to push that it's not just for gamers and that's not like the only space that it can be beneficial in and like like you guys were talking about with distributed teams or being able to interact with people across the country in a social way I think that's really the way forward right right yeah um Anything else to add, guys? Uh, otherwise, we can move on. Uh, I just want to thank our friends over at Science Daily, TechCrunch, and Gadget, and the Next Web for bringing us all of our stories this week. We post all these articles across our social media pages, so be sure to go ahead and follow us all over there, uh, Facebook, Twitter, everything, uh, to stay in the loop. All right, Blake, what's up next? All right, so you guys know the seconds and minutes you waste waiting for the elevator to arrive or yeah. for a friend to reply to an IM or even for a website to load? Well, a team at MIT's InSale researchers believe you can put the, those minutes and seconds to good use. So they created a series of apps called the Wait Suite that makes the most of those idle moments by helping you learn a new language. Based on the team's pre preliminary tests, some of the tools could prove more useful than others, depending on your situation. If your computer takes a while to before it connects to Wi-Fi, you can learn a word or two. You can test one of Wait Suite's apps available for download from the CSAIL website. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I thought this was great because my computer is definitely old and takes a long time to do anything. Yes. I, I'm i excited to try this out. I uh, have been waiting for the mobile app um, because I would like to learn. Um, I, I would like to brush up on my Spanish. I'd like to think that I have enough memory in there to uh, brush up on it, but for sure, I would like to to have a tool that helps me optimize my seconds and minutes uh, doing nothing. Mia, what do you think of this one? I had the complete different reaction to you guys. I was like, oh my God, can I just have a moment to do nothing and get used <laughs> to um, not being completely bombarded and saturated with electronic stimuli or digital stimuli? You know, it's, we as a society have forgotten how to not get bored with nothingness. Like stop trying to fill every second of my day. I can just relax between loading pages. That's that's how I feel about it. <laughs> See, that's why we love you on the show because you bring that fresh perspective. Blake and I are always like, yeah, this is cool. This is cool. This is cool. And you're like, no, this sucks. Let's don't, don't do this. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's okay to not have something immediately when you require it. I understand that we're so... Um, so driven for things to immediately gratify us. You know, you click something, you want it to immediately react. But sometimes you just need to relax and know that being patient is a virtue and you need to exercise it every once in a while. Fair enough, fair enough. I think, so the way my mind works is I'm always trying to optimize. So listeners of the show know that I commute probably like, what, two and a half, three hours a day. And... Uh, I like to optimize my time very much so to where I'm listening to podcasts at, at like twice the speed in my car 
uh, to consume so much media, right? And so, like, these micro-interactions when I'm uh, hanging out waiting for something to happen, like, I don't know, I, I usually get bored when I'm waiting for something. When, But, like, if I'm walking, I don't need it. But if I'm waiting for something, that's when I'm really, like, I need something to be productive or feel productive. I don't know. I see your point, though. Like, I, uh, there are definitely times when I want to go, yes, no, this is me time. Nothing else is going to interfere. Yeah, and I have to agree with me as well. Like, we do, we are just inundated with technology all the time, from our phones to computers to, like, Fitbits, all that kind of stuff, constantly telling us what the hell's going on without using our own two eyes. I think the only thing that drew me to this was that it's language learning, because it's that's something I've struggled with for so long. Because um, I can... I can understand french fairly well but i can't really speak it so i figured maybe this was another way to kind of boost me practicing a language uh, but i definitely agree with you mia we should be able to be patient and you know deal with the silence or the couple seconds between page clicks <laughs> yeah i should have two more thoughts on this um i am all for learning a new language and i actually use uh, an app that's really good because it, it lets you speak into a microphone and um practice your your accent and um, it makes you write it makes you translate from one language to the next so and I don't know if I'm allowed to say it but I'm gonna say it it's Duolingo and I love it it's free it's amazing so I take time out of my day to actually practice that Um, the other one that I wanted the other thought that I had was that if we're constantly consuming media and listening to things and reading things we're actually not thinking we're consuming so it's good to exercise that, you know, like those times in the day to process things. Maybe think some, maybe not think at all, but it's good to pause. No, I agree. I agree. Uh, all right, let's, let's move on to the next story here. All right, so Google Home can now distinguish between different voices and reply with a personalized response. The update allows up to six people to share a Google Home. So now when you ask... For your morning commute, you'll get information about your route and not your spouse's. The same goes for playlists, schedules, shopping lists, travel info, and every other kind of personalized information you'd want to ask your Google Assistant about. The update rolled out in the U.S. last week and plans to come to the U.K. in the coming months. Now, Nick, I don't have any experience with having something like Google Home or Alexa in my living space. So what do you really think about this? Um... I this is a necessity and I can't believe it wasn't in there from day one. I guess, you know, we didn't have the power to do it then. But um, uh, I it's just something that's like a duh to me. Like I if I ask Google Home something, it should be able to tell that it's me and it should be able to tell that, you know, I I I want this thing to happen. Uh, and then it should also likewise be able to tell that when somebody else in the household asks a question, they they get their answer that is tailored to them. I think, you know, it's it's one of those things that I, it should have been in for day one. What about you, Blake? What do you think? Honestly, uh, I don't know. I've I've got this weird thing about talking to like Google <laughs> Home or any of that kind of stuff. I, I did like the fact that like a lot of this is based off of stuff that Google cards already do. So it would be cool. Like if I was sitting there and I happened to ask my phone or in this case, Google home, like, Hey, what do I have planned today? And it could give me like a rollout of like my schedule. But honestly, I still have just hesitation putting one of these in my house. I don't know why. Maybe it's because it's always listening. I don't know, Mia, what do you think? Well, I'm, I'm with you on just being a little skeptical and a little skittish about having an always listening device. Um, for people that have them and people that people that have them always love them. I've talked to a lot of people that have them and they, they don't know what they would do without it. So for people that have them, I think, um, like Nick said, this was a natural progression of where they were coming to because they know that there's multiple people in a household and everybody has their own unique needs and different schedules and different things that they want to get out of the device. So it makes perfect sense. And I'm sure they'll continue to get better with voice recognition and natural language. So. Yeah. I have to It'll back. Be technology vision. I have to back up to one of your comments. Uh, to people who have them, always love them. Uh, you've met Justine, and Justine's my partner, and uh, <laughs> she she absolutely hates Alexa. Like I brought her into the house, right? And I I don't know competition with another woman or something, but uh, like 
I don't know. She hates interacting with her, but she's very she's a very sort of reserved, introverted uh, person. And so, you know, for her, speaking takes energy and she doesn't want to talk to anybody. And like, I mean, I'm, I'm painting her in, in the extreme, but, you know, it's like it's it's taxing to exert energy to talk to something. But to me, as a, a fairly extroverted individual who, you know, hosts a podcast, I think it's it's I like it. But um, I don't know. Uh, there's there's this whole field on computers being social actors and how eventually you'll just kind of talk to get the things that you want. And, um, you know, we, we covered it in one of our really early shows. Uh, pretty. It was it was very surface level and, and uh, worth worth checking into. But um, not everybody who has them likes them. Let me just leave it at that. All right. <laughs> what do we got up yeah. next? An extension of. So that that may still hold, <laughs> but I, I'm interested about the comment that you made about um, you know like you're a very extroverted person and you love it and she's very introverted and um, she hates it. I wonder if there's a correlation right there. You know, uh, it's interesting. I wonder if anybody has looked into that. Potentially, maybe you just gave our listeners some idea for a research study, and if you, if she did, please uh, you know let us know the results of that and uh, to credit us with the idea. Thank you. All right. There's your thesis right there, guys. <laughs> exactly. You are welcome, all you graduate students listening to this program. All right. What's up next, Blake? All right. So speaking of Amazon and AI, so Amazon Lex, the technology powering Amazon's virtual assistant Alexa, has exited preview phase as of last week. The system, which involves natural language understanding technology combined with automatic speech rec- recognition, was first introduced in November at Amazon's AWS reInvent Converse in Vegas. Amazon explained how Lex can be used by developers who want to build their own conversational applications like chatbots. Developers interested in Amazon Lex can get started for free and tinker away. Now, I love the fact that Amazon is making this open source to developers to mess around with and that they can use it in things like chatbots or even in their own homemade uh, devices. Yeah, so uh, they they actually even mention in the article that this is going to be competing with, um, you know, devices potentially that Amazon puts out, and they're they're kind of pulling that whole um, uh, that that structure where it's uh, you know this could potentially bite us in the butt, but you know it, it's for the better of everything really. So I I don't know, like I I I, I love this. I love that. It's out there. One thing that I really want is Alexa in my vehicle because uh, Alexa in my vehicle would mean I can, like, I, I again, I drive two and a half hours a day, and sometimes I get these random thoughts where I'm like, oh, what is this or what is that? And I'll just, like, or I'll see a billboard, and I'm like, oh, what actress was that movie or what, what movie was that actress in or um, you know, what's this times this I'm doing math in my head while I'm driving. Like there are plenty of opportunities while I'm driving. I want this in my car, man. This is awesome. Oh, to clarify, I don't think this is free. I think, um, I think this is actually costs per request, uh, for like text or speech request. Um, it's, it's, yeah, they mentioned that it's like every query you have to pay Amazon for something. Yeah. Uh, Mia, what do you think about this one? Well, see, voice recognition things, um, since I have an accent, it it kind of gives me a headache just because I know how many times I've had to say something multiple times when I call a customer service line that has a chatbot. So, um, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic. Great if it learns how to, to, to understand what I'm saying and it doesn't make me repeat myself. And, you know, the, the more people that are doing this, the better. So that's that's really all I have. Yeah, I mean, have you tried like how how many times has it, has it taken you to um like get the computer to do something that you want uh with your uh, accent? Google's pretty good. So, I uh, I will give that to Google. I use um the okay Google multiple times and it it's very very good. It's just um when I'm thinking about customer service and the chatbots that I've interacted with that I have been outside of of Google, they have to come a long way. But I think Google has it has done a pretty good job with, with my accent. I mean, I I know people that have stronger accents that could not get a word in. So it's just a matter of continuing to improve the system. So I, I just want to break really quick and do an aside. Are we, are we uh, casting live from the playground today? 
<laughs> yeah, it seems <laughs> like it. I apologize, guys. Yeah, it's got the kids playing outside today, but it's all good. That's okay. It's okay. Human Factors Cast is a family show, uh, or it was for a very long time, and and potentially is still today. Because I mean, we haven't really done anything too bad. All right, what's up next? I just have to throw this out because I just thought about it. Hearing all the kids makes me reminiscent of being in Billy's house. So shout out to Mister Billy Hall. I hope oh yeah, well. yeah, he's doing well. He's doing well. All right, so. Keep it on. So Montreal-based Liarbird's new science will let you synthesize speech in anyone's voice from just a minute-long recording. Yes, just a minute long. Which means you could, for instance, create your own episode of Human Factors Cast by analyzing Nick and Blake's voices. Yeah, give it a try. It might be funny. Liarbird has posted some audio examples that sound pretty convincing. The company says that it doesn't require the speaker to say the words that you'll use to make the voice recording that you want to. And it'll also be able to create different intonations. Now, Nick, are you going to play us a clip of this? Yeah, I do have a clip of this. So, uh, yeah, the idea behind this is that they take a minute long slab of audio um, and they analyze it, break it down and find key factors of that voice, Uh, the timbre, pitch, intonation, all that stuff. And then they, they put it together through their algorithm, and they produce something uh, that sounds like your voice, but it's saying something else. And, um, you know, th- the the key takeaway with this is that this was produced with one minute of audio, right? And, uh, I mean, we can talk about it in a sec, but let me, let me play the clip here. Uh, let me make sure I got my sound up for this guy. Uh, so this is our um, supreme leader of the free nation here. Hang on. It does not convey the opinion of Donald Trump. Oh, wait. Yeah. I am Donald Trump. This is very, very important. And let me tell you, this year, I am coming to the iClear conference. I have heard many, many things about this conference. It's a tremendous conference. I would like to meet the best researchers who wants to see me. I love you all. It's going to be huge. Believe me. So, again, that's one minute of audio that they're able to get all that with. I don't even understand how from one minute of audio you can just create anything. Yeah. That is terrifying. Yeah, isn't it? (laughs) Isn't it? It is so terrifying. In the the original article, they actually said, you know, that you can create a a text to speech of uh, Donald Trump declaring war on on Canada. Like this, this could be. There's so much power with this. Like, I don't understand. Um, Blake and I were talking before the show, like, what is the purpose of this? And I think the only plausible reason that we came up with was that, you know, sometimes um, you might want to create your own AI voice. You know, like if you if you have like imagine um, the guy from her wants to hear Scarlett Johansson. So he grabs a one minute clip of Scarlett Johansson and boom. His AI is suddenly Scarlett Johansson. So I think potentially in that regard, fine. But then you have the ethics of, can I use your voice? Um, Can you say things, certain things with your voice? Like there's so many ethical questions that need to be addressed. And this this, uh, website, Liarbird, they actually even have an ethics section on their website that kind of is uh, really like, yeah, you know, we're not responsible for anything you do with this, but we're doing it. I think what what I got from the article is that they wanted to make people aware of this technology already being out in the world. So um, just because it's such a powerful thing that if people people are going to get duped, I mean, left and right. Um, now you you can't trust video, you can't trust pictures. Now you can't even trust a like a voice clip or somebody's calling oh. you. And I I think the implications are are enormous. So and yeah. this is really scary. You just brought something to my attention that I didn't even think about uh, scams. So obviously I thought about scams, but not in the sense of like pretending to be somebody that you know. Hi, this is your mom. I need I need you to help me. I need you to send me some money because I'm in trouble or something. You know, and like if you spoof the phone number and have it sent to you through your mom's phone number, like there's just so many things that they could exploit this is crazy yeah. i mean we can get too dark with this but like proof of life it doesn't mean anything yeah. anymore you know what i mean like yeah it's just insane 
Do do we want to hear another sample? Hang on. I have I have more samples. Let's see if we can pull <laughs> them. I just feel like fake news is about to get a whole lot worse. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Hang on. Let's I'm going to pull this one up. I'm going to see what this one says. Uh let's see if I if I can pull it up here. I can speak with so many different voices. Oh yeah, this is where they're going through like they they go through a loop of of different voices and they say the same thing with different intonations. I I wonder if it'll keep so going. Many different voices. I'm not a robot. My intonation is always different. I'm not a robot. My intonation is always different. I'm not a robot. My intonation is always different. I am not a robot. My intonation is always different. I am not a robot. My intonation is always different. That's crazy. Yeah, it's pretty insane. I mean, you can you can hear that little bit like robotic twang at the end of things. Oh yeah. But towards the end there, as it was getting like higher, it was disappearing. I just I'm I, I, I again one minute of audio. Yeah, and the fact that this seems to be I mean it, it's out. They've, they've been doing this for a while, but the longer they do it, the more the more they can perfect it, and it's just gonna get to a point where you can't tell the difference. You probably can't even tell the difference with your own voice. You know, if you hear it enough right yeah no exactly uh and blake you and i have over 40 hours of our voice on the interwebs so uh effectively our listeners can build their own episode now yes they can <laughs> and what might even be even more insane because this is a startup but what does adobe's new product sound like that's been out for a year that's doing something similar oh yeah that's and, what's really scary and is, it, is and, it even better or is it any any different i don't know i'd imagine it's better too because they they require 20 minutes so oh that's right they have a lot more sample to deal with and they got a bunch more money behind them that's oh yeah probably intense oh yeah who knows i'd love to hear a sample of that all right what's up next is this our last story oh uh, we got two more two more all right. So many experts think of artificial intelligence as cold, logical, and objectively rational. But in a new study, researchers have just demonstrated how machines can be reflections of us in potentially problematic ways. Common machine learning programs, when trained with ordinary human language available online, can acquire cultural biases embedded in patterns of wording. The, this is what the researchers found. These biases range from morally neutral, like the preference for flowers over insects, to the objectionable views of race and gender. The silver lining is that we can teach them, them being these AI and learning programs, to avoid this bias. Similar to how parents and mentors try to instill concepts of fairness and equality in children and students, coders can endeavor to make their machines reflect the better angels of human nature. Now, that seems just outrageous to me, to, to think that, okay, I'm building this really complex algorithm, and now I've got to build ethics into the program. Right. And, and you know, ethics are based on the person who's programming it. So right? there's that. Yeah, because so that's just variance right there. Woo. Yeah. I mean, we saw this a couple a couple months ago, I think, with uh, Tay, the racist Twitter bot. Um, I, I forget who put it. I think there was Microsoft put out the Twitter bot. And uh, it was supposed to learn from all the stuff on Twitter. And it, like, within a day or something, it turned into this racist, homophobic, um, just terrible Twitter account that had to be shut down right <laughs> away. <laughs> and it was using, it was deep, it was using deep learning and algorithms to produce these things. So yes, if it's paired with uh, the way we view others in this world, like it could be scary. You know what the sad thing about that is? That means that that kind of stuff just exists out there in such volume that that's what it picks up the most. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mia, well, that's, that's, a, just, that's a bummer. Mia, what do you think Tw about this one? Uh, I was going to say Twitter is known to, uh, for being such a hate, um, hate of sphere, whatever they call it. So, of course, I mean, it's like when you have a child that is in an environment of a bunch of people that cuss all the time. That's what they're going to pick up. Same thing. Yeah. I'm so very true. Yeah. I uh, I'm trying to gauge how much I could I could spill. Um, I just reviewed an article about um, I won't say what their premise was, but I will say that it was about RoboCops, right? And this this kind of thing, um, like this to me, if RoboCops pick up, you know, morally, uh, sort of 
irrational moral morality triggers from the internet and and uh, totally biased views. Like that's scary to me because then these cops are gonna be out there, uh, like like real cops. I don't know. All right, I, I it's depressing me. But silver lining, if we teach them to be good, right? <laughs> I, guess, <laughs> I guess that's silver lining. I don't know. That's just like that's an extra burden on a coder now, which is I know. insane, right? <laughs> How do we code uh, morality? All right, bias, <laughs> unbiased morality. Any from one person? Any other thoughts on this one, guys? Let's end with something good. All right, <laughs> let's. I mean, this is good news at least for our our younger listeners, not for us. Bummer. All right. Well, anyway, good news for the younger listeners. So people's ability to make random choices or mimic a random process, such as coming up with hypothetical results for a series of coin flips, peaks around age 25. Oh, man. So according to a study published by the PL PLOS Computational Biology, the scientists analyzed participants' choices according to their algorithm algorithmic randomness, which is based on the idea that, pa that patterns that are more random are harder to summarize mathematically. After controlling for characteristics such as gender, language, and education, they found that age was the only factor that affected the ability to behave randomly. This ability peaked at age 25 and on average and declined from then on. So my random behavior is far gone now, that's for sure. There may be hope for you because I have a fun story. Uh, my 86-year-old grandmother went paragliding two weeks ago. Oh, Talk about that's awesome. I know. And talk about random. So see, there might be some hope for some of us. I love that story. Um, <laughs> you know, this, th uh, I hate to plug this. Oh no, I don't hate to plug this book. This book is so good. Uh, algorithms to live by kind of backs this up, right? They're talking about how, um, young people are very, um, uh, they're talking about the, uh, what is it? Exploit, um, explore, exploit, ratio where like you explore options and then once you find a good option you exploit it right and so young people are exploring all these options and the older you get the more exploitive you get because you are um you effectively don't have as much time to live uh and so something like this makes a lot of sense because they are exploring all these options and so they're not calcified by these sort of uh choices that they they are exploiting i guess i don't know it's a good book guys go read it it's so fantastic <laughs> it really is well, the, one, the one thing that i get from this is that it, i want to pay attention to being more exploratory versus just exploiting options that i already know are possible uh, so maybe i'll be able to seem like i'm younger than i am who knows yeah, yeah just what... get out of your comfort zone every once in a while just think outside the box and we'll fight this random thing at 25 yeah Precisely. what if, <laughs> what if we are uh what if we're 25 at heart or for that matter what if we're 12 at heart <laughs> <laughs> so like so random. when you're 86 years old right all right well that's going to be it for today everyone if you guys have any suggestions for topics or news stories that you want us to cover you can follow us on social media we're always hanging out over there head on over to the human factors cast facebook page comment on our soundcloud reach us at h factors podcast on twitter we are not racist over there i promise uh, or leave us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. You can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If we like what you say, we'll put it on the show. You can also support our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. We bring these shows to you ad-free because we love you. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on iTunes is now Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or your favorite podcast directory. I want to thank Blake Armstrong for being on the show today. Where can they find you at? You guys can help me make Twitter not such a hateful place by contacting me at Don't Panic UX. All right. And Mia Haramijo, where can they find you? I'm on LinkedIn. LinkedIn um, slash Manuela Haramijo. Perfect. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. Oh, it depends. It depends. It depends. Depends on if you're 25 or not. Or 12. 